Right. Well, the, the big killer is sugar. Yeah. Um, glucose, particularly fructose, is also pernicious. And if you give animals lots of glucose, um, and especially fructose, they will get fatty liver disease, they'll get diabetes. It's really bad. There are two reasons that glucose is bad when it spikes. Three, if you include the brain fog, but let's just talk about physiology here. Uh, one is that you're going to have glucose attached to proteins that makes them glum up. Think of it like caramelized body parts. This will ultimately lower your longevity, reduce your longevity, give you type, type, type 2 diabetes and probably cardiovascular disease on top of that. So that's one, keep those glucose levels down. But also what glucose is going to be doing to you at high levels is shutting off those protective mechanisms. Remember, particularly AMPK and the sirtuins, they get switched off by sugar. Hmm. So by having that up for most of the day, if you're eating three meals plus snacks, your defenses against disease and aging are going to be working at a minimum. So instead, keep those glucose levels low and consistent. You won't get the brain fog. You'll get fewer proteins modified that'll lead to disease. And thirdly, importantly, you'll actually stimulate your body's natural defenses against disease and aging. You can quit something, but you don't have to be draconian about it. I still like to steal a, little, you know, a few scoops of ice cream if I see it, but I'm not going to eat a giant bowl of ice cream every night. Uh, but yeah, so glucose is a bad one. Uh, something else to avoid is super high protein uh, because mTOR, it, it can be activated, but you don't want it activated all the time because it's not going to turn on the autophagy, the defenses to recycle proteins. There's a lot of people who believe that carnivore diets are the best for longevity. There are short-term gains. You'll feel better if you eat meat. You'll obviously have the protein to build up that muscle. But we can go through the evidence. When you look at populations of what they eat and how long they live, as well as the short-term effects when you eat a high-protein uh, carnivorous red meat-based diet, those changes are, will be good in the short run. But long-term, there's no evidence. In fact, I would say there's counter evidence to that being beneficial for longevity if that's your goal. It's funny when I say I've gone vegetarian recently, which is a where fact. Where are you going to get your protein? Yeah, where do you get protein yeah. from? Well, what do you think plants made of? It's, it's also mostly protein. Now, they're not as bioavailable, so you're getting like two thirds the amount as you would from a steak. Your body has to like, work a little harder for it. Great. Yeah. I want my body to work harder. It's good for it. It burns energy. And it's also activating these defenses, as we mentioned. So I, I'm now trying out this uh, a full vegetarian diet. I'm not yet vegan, but that actually probably works even better for longevity as the science will tell. I, do. I, I eat a lot of plants. Uh, we've discovered that there are molecules in plants besides resveratrol that are healthy. And we actually think that these molecules are signaling to our body to turn on these natural defenses. We call it xenohormesis, X-E-N-O hormesis. Remember, hormesis is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, xeno means from other plants and other species. And by eating plants that are colored and stressed, and by stressed I mean they've been picked when they're dehydrated or too much sun or, or organic foods, they're typically more stressed than those that are in, um, under, under pesticides. Those give us those molecules that I think uh, add to the other things that I mentioned. Uh, first of all, we have a theory that uh, bears out, which is eat foods that are stressed, stressed out. Uh, which is a weird concept, right? But we do it naturally. We, we drink, some of us drink red wine, which is a stressed grape before we pick it. We often eat colored foods. So spinach is a dark green food. There's blueberries, which are dark. Uh, the whiter ones are not as, as good. So why is that? Well, stressed food produces a lot of what we call xenohermetic molecules. And uh, I'll explain what that means. It's a terrible word we coined, but xeno, X-E-N-O, means from other species. Mm -hmm. And hormesis is a very important word. You got to remember the word hormesis because every day you should think about it. Hormesis is what doesn't kill us, makes us live longer. So that's nutrition, colored foods, stressed foods. Organic is stressed, right? You don't want the perfect lettuce that's been not put any stress. Mm. Um, and we need to do more of that. We need to let our plants stress a little bit before we eat them. Well, what's on David Sinclair's longevity food grocery list? Oh, food. Lots of them. Yeah. Okay, so- Food, food. I so as a as a guide, I try to choose foods that have been grown under stressful conditions. So these would be organic for a start, a locally grown, and not in a just a regular hothouse uh, with lots of nutrients and water. So if I can go to a local um, farm, I'll do that. And 
But the other way you can do it is you can look for foods that have a lot of color, the purples, the reds, the very deep greens. These are signs that the plants are making healthy molecules for you. These xenohormetans, as I mentioned. So the, the top foods would be, if I could only eat one food, it would probably be avocados. The next one, I do like very high quality, fresh, very tasty, you know, with maybe a little bit of bread or gluten-free bread dipped in there, but not a lot. I try to avoid carbs like that. So we've got two. The third one would be a roasted Brussels sprouts, pan fried, a bit of garlic and uh, salt and pepper. That's three. But the next would be um, cantaloupe or rock melon, as I would call it. As a fruit, that's the most nutritious you can get. And if I could pick another one in that category, I'd say blueberries as well. I snack on those pretty often. And then the fourth category, our fifth category that's important would be the nuts. And so cashews are my favorite, but I also have Brazil nuts, basilian, and just a whole variety of nuts during the day. So if I'm peckish, I'll take a few. And the protein in the nuts suppresses appetite. Uh, I'm not sure. We don't have the data. If, if all this avocado consumption is good for us. And I was like, whoa, 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 hold on. You just said like, there's no Santa Claus to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very happy to hear avocados in yes. Vermont. Well, well, I'm, I'm a good friend and colleague of Falters. We've known each other since we were kids, actually in our twenties. And we like to debate, but where I, I would disagree about that is that we know that avocados have high levels of oleic acid as well. Uh, so does uh, olive oil. And oleic acid will activate CERT1, which is an enzyme that controls longevity in our bodies. And so we know at least some of the components, such as oleic acid, are extraordinarily yes, beneficial. Are. Uh, we've, we now have a very good handle on what causes us to grow old, uh, what lifestyle factors influence that. We can now measure biological age very accurately with a, a swab, a uh, cheek swab or a blood test. Um, and we now, just in the last few years, uh, I believe have a very good handle on, on understanding how to reverse the age of the body, not just slow down aging, but truly reset the, the youthful information that I believe resides in every cell in the body. And uh, three years ago, we didn't know that existed. We thought that aging was a one-way street and the best you could do was to slow it down. Uh, but as I'll tell you today, um, there's something brand new. You know, similar to, I would, I would liken it to uh, people who are trying to fly around the world in hot air balloons, thinking that was the best they could ever do. Um, and three years ago, the, we had the equivalent of the first powered flight uh, by the Wright brothers. And when that happens, then you really have to start changing your views of what's possible. So what's interesting about the science of aging is that people over the centuries, or arguably the millennia, have figured out why certain populations and individuals live longer than others. And, and it's just observation, right? It's, it's obvious that if you eat Mediterranean-like diets and you don't eat overeat uh, carbohydrates in particular, but be, be, if you become obese, if you don't move, these lead to poor health outcomes and shorter lifespans. And we can do this to animals in the lab. It's pretty easy. You can shorten their lifespan by about 40%. And the opposite is true as well. If you take animals, and I include dogs and rats, um, mice, of course, in my lab, if you restrict how much they eat, uh, roughly 20, 30%. I mean, it doesn't matter how you do it, as long as you do it, you can skip a meal a day, or you can just give them a little bit each meal. That has remarkable longevity and health benefits so that they're not just living longer, actually at the same age, uh, they are remarkably healthier compared to the mice that ate whatever they wanted to, called ad libitum. So this is not new and it's not even rocket science. Um, even exercise, we know that 10 minutes of losing your breath every day has health benefits, but nobody's really come up with a good explanation as to why that happens. It's so obvious we take it for granted, but why does eating, eating less make you healthier? And that's where these breakthroughs have come in. Uh, my field over the last 20 years have discovered uh, three key areas in the cell, three key genetic pathways that respond to diet and exercise and hunger uh, and turn on the body's natural defenses against the deterioration process we call aging. Um, and then we've taken that just recently much further and achieved what exercise and a good healthy diet could, 
could never alone do, and that is reset the age of the body. We don't know the best diet, partly because um, everybody's different um, and everybody has different uh, uh, you know, levels of willpower. The one that, that I do uh, is called the 16-8. I try to skip breakfast. I have a little bit of breakfast. Um, I'll show you. So this is a typical breakfast. For me, it's a couple of spoonfuls of, of low-fat yogurt, uh, plain yogurt with some resveratrol and some NMN thrown in. The, I can tell you later what they do, but these are molecules we've discovered in my lab uh, to um, activate defenses in the body that we call the sirtuins. Um, do I know that this is going to make me live longer? No. Um, but do I know that they're very, very safe and very cheap? Yeah. So that's the risk I'm taking. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to live forever. Uh, any of you who've seen what car of, kind of car I drive, I drive a Tesla, you know, you can tell that I'm not trying to live forever, but I am trying to learn things uh, within the short time that I have on this planet. There's not much time left. I'm, I'm now 51. Um, my father has a very similar diet, um, eating these molecules, very small breakfast, try to skip lunch or have just a tiny um, lunch, maybe a salad. Uh, and then, then dinner is, is, is normal. You know, some alcohol, I even eat meat if I've been working out. So it's, I put all my enjoyment towards the end of the day. But if you don't like dinner, you can have a big breakfast. But as long as one of the meals in your, your day has been skipped, that's a very good start. But some people are better than me. Some people can skip meals entirely for two or three days. Uh, even some people go for a week, which I suppose may be better than what I do. I, I just cannot do it. Uh, I cannot function. I, I tend to get too hungry. Um, but the way I do it, uh, with a bit of yogurt in the morning, with my pill, uh, I don't get, don't get hungry at all. In fact, I feel a lot better not being bloated. 